What's up, Badger fans? Uh, we have uh, a guy to the portal. Let's talk about Connor, and then let's talk football, the quarterbacks. Let's talk about that young log jam. Let's get into it on Wisconsin. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Locked On Badgers. I got Justin over there. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Um, ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada. Go find your next big adventure. Check it out today at NissanUSA.com. And Justin, the Badgers basketball team is not the type of driver that likes to push it just a little bit further. They're content. No kidding. Getting off that exit. We're good. Yeah. The exit, the first round of the NCAA tournament. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> State is right there. There's a Motel 6. We're comfortable. Yeah. We're solid. <laughs> Um, I was we weren't gonna talk any Aiming basketball. high with the Motel Six. There you go, Badgers. <laughs> we weren't gonna talk any basketball. It was literally just gonna be football, football, football. But then Connor, we got news, Connor Seijin uh hits the portal, has transferred from the program. Honestly, uh, Justin, I'll kick it to you to, to get your initial well, thought. I mean, first things first, does the boom box go with them? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm good All with right. That. Um yeah, I, I mean, we knew this was gonna happen for a long time. Like you and I thought this was a likelihood probably what a quarter of the way through the season that yeah. it was a, it was something that was kind of percolating. Um, not that we knew anything, just that the way things were playing out, it seemed like there was it, it was a really odd situation. So it was one of those things where I I personally felt like I, I don't know what the upside is to him sticking around. Like unless he just loves Wisconsin that much, it makes no sense for him to stay here. Now, I will say you and I kind of agree on this. People are turning him into kind of a legend that he's he's the boogeyman. He's the Baba Yaga of uh, college Yaga. basketball players. He's John Wick. And it's like people need to slow their roll with that some somewhat. Connor's been really inconsistent dating back to last season, the tail end of last year. He was good in a couple of spurts this season, but he was also really bad in a couple of spurts. And he's borderline unplayable on defense. So – I'm not putting that all on him. I think that he was failed to an extent and how he was handled this year, which is part of the reason why he's leaving. But this was not a good situation. And it looked, it quite frankly looks bad. Like he went from being a guy who was like an all conference freshman team to being a guy who's just played what four minutes a game, five minutes a game this year. Not, yeah. He was, he was in the tier that comes in with one minute left in blowout games. Mm -hmm. Like that, that was the tier. He yeah. Failed. The, the the ultimate slap in the face. Yeah, that's the Chris Hodges tier. Like that's the <laughs> and no, no, it is what it, it is. is. No, I get what you're saying. Dark Ray says we failed Connor. I I think Justin hit on both parts of this nuance for me. Like Con Connor, there's a responsibility to play better. Like if, mm -hmm. if Connor shot 30 percent this year as a shooter, like that's not good enough. Um, and his defense leaves a lot to be wanting now. I we said it on the show. I didn't think the minutes he got were as consistent as they should have been. I think that messes with the kid. And then as soon as you get in, you feel like you got to jack up shots. But like, there's a responsibility you got to play better yeah. too. And this idea that we had Steph Curry percolating on the bench, yeah. like he he's he, I think he can, listen. I'll also say this, Justin. This is what the portal's here for. A player has fallen out of rotation. Like I, I'm all about him going somewhere else and being successful. Oh, yeah. Him, well, and and to your to your point, looking at him, I think he felt like he had to jack up shots. Like I think there were some rush shots from him this year because he felt like I have to prove that I deserve to be out on the court. So he probably jacked up some shots. There was a little Marcus Ilver in him where he gets out on the court and he's like, I touched the ball, I gotta put it up because otherwise I'm never gonna get an opportunity to. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right. So that's the Connor talk. Like I, I want to mostly talk football as somebody yeah. in the chat said, the title of the show mentioned football, Steve Mitchell, you are correct. We're getting there, Steve. <laughs> um, it just broke. So I, I had no intention of talking basketball because I've left that behind for a, yeah. a few days. Um, well, I want to start with quarterbacks, Justin spring. Oh, sorry. You're about to say something. I cut you no, off. No, I, I'm good. Go ahead. Sure. You don't want to talk more about your basketball. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, Ryan is still recovering from the, the abomination that was the first round of the NCAA tournament. Listen, that that hit me in the heart and the wallet. I'll <laughs> say that. 
Uh, let's talk quarterbacks. I thought, I think this is, so I have a couple of spring storylines. I'm going to kick it over to you, see if you have any spring storylines too. I kind of just shotgunned an invitation invitation out to you on this show. So mm. I didn't have much time to prepare, but I think quarterbacks is really interesting to me. Um, there are reports that Evers looks good. Cole LaCrue posted something that he's finally healthy. I know Mabry's in and he's gotten some buzz. Uh, is he a- healthy? Is LaCrue healthy or is he saying that he's he's rehabbing? He's healthy from, okay. from what I've been told. Yep. Okay. He has been rehabbing. He's had a couple injuries. Interesting that he's not in the three slot. Isn't he? I thought he was like in the co-three slot. Or is Evers, that- Evers and Mabry were the ones taking snaps with the two. So, I, yeah, there's a lot to talk about here. I want to start with, and I think you and I even talked about this off the show, the idea that Locke and TVD, Tyler Van Dyke are splitting. Tyler Van Dyke's a starter. Like that is yeah. beyond. Yeah. People, people need to get over that. It's quite simply, and I think – Somebody said, or they talked to Fickle, and he basically said, we're splitting guys with the ones and guys with the twos because we want to get them reps with guys who are actually in the two deep. Makes sense. And, and it does. Early on, you'll, you'll as we get further into camp, they'll start to split that up and they'll get guys in the spots that they think they're actually supposed to be in. Right now, you want a – this is where you build some experience with the starters with someone like Braden Locke. So he's not coming in having only – run reps with the twos if he gets thrown into a football game and it's like you need to have some chemistry with those receivers in the one group and I know they kind of switch and swap and stuff like that in practice but he needs to have the guys that he's going to be that are going to be out on the field starting that he has some reps with yeah I think that makes a ton of sense how how likely do you think and I I, I, my answer is it's almost very 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 unlikely but how likely do you think it is that Mabry, that Evers, that LaCrue even could unseat Braden Locke this year as the number two guy? I don't think that it won't happen in the spring. I'll, I'll flat out say that. Unless somebody is just lights out right from the start, it's not happening. I guess you'd say probably the person that's most likely is Evers. If he suddenly, if the switch clicked and he's now suddenly throwing dimes all over the field and, and mm-hmm. looking poised and doing everything, like the skill set's there for him. It's It's whether or not the coaching staff looks at him and says, all right, it's worth moving you up because we can't hold you back. Uh, Mabry, I doubt. Um, if he did, I would say it's not going to happen till fall camp, and it would probably be like midway through fall camp. They're like, wow, he's it's taken off. Like yeah. The ability starting to click. I, I think Mabry, the perfect season for Mabry, and you and I are both, we've been high on Mabry for a while. And I think the perfect season for Mabry is a lot of reps this year, preparation, and next year he's battling for the starting spot. I think that's like the perfect yeah. For Mabry, yeah, and you do it. Even even next year, if he's not announced starter, I I honestly think what will end up happening is they are going to have him play a series here and there, or they'll get him involved in the game because the upside is off the charts a bit. Like if it clicks mentally for him, I mean, he's got every tool in his bag that you could ask for. It's for him to be a, a guy who could take off. It's just going to be all mental with whether or not he'll be ready to go. So here's the other part I want to talk about with quarterbacks because. I have another statement coming up in the show, and I don't know if we'll get to it or not because we, had, we were talking Connor too. But the transfer portal is going to open up again after spring. Yeah. Um, it feels like this is maybe the last stand for a couple of quarterbacks on this depth chart. It does. I, I think for, for Evers primarily is one that I look at right off the bat. If he doesn't make a move this spring, it's going to be in his best interest to move on somewhere else because the, the guys that have come in behind him, he's going to have to worry about them potentially unseating him. Yep, I that's that's the first one that shoots my head. I think LaCruz is the other one. I I really like the mm-hmm. tangible LaCruz brings, but if this is an offseason where Mabry maybe makes a big jump and Braden Locke is still the number two, and you know Braden Locke's younger brother is coming in the next yeah. level unless something changes, I don't know where that path is for a LaCruz or an Evers if they can't make their move mm-hmm. this offseason. And Evers is the guy. You nailed it. Bro, you could send Evers to the combine now, and he would be one of the top quarterbacks in the combine. Yeah. He's like from a, from an actual like measurables, of course. Uh, yeah. From a testing standpoint, yeah. Not from- yeah. He'd probably run four or five. He would probably be throwing the ball 60 yards downfield consistently. Like the arm is there, everything is there. He's gonna three cone it, he's gonna do all the things that you'd like to look at. And he he would do it, but it's gotta click mentally on the field. And that's that's the biggest thing you and I have always talked about. Like I don't even think these coaches totally know if somebody's gonna do it. Like they can an- if you're sitting there sitting down with a quarterback, I'm sure they can answer and tell you exactly what you're supposed to do. Now, whether or not you do that post snap are two different things. And how how do your eyes lie to you or do you 
are you able to decipher what you're seeing and be able to to process that and, and do it effectively? It doesn't get required in high school very much. Like nobody plays anybody that they're looking at a SEC or Big Ten defensive line coming downhill at them when they have to process. So normally they're sitting back there for five seconds and just throwing it to the open guy who's probably a receiver that has four yards of separation because that's just how it is in high school. Yeah, it's a lot easier, especially especially for some of the teams that overmatch people. The receivers, oh, yeah. wide open. if you're a top team in the in your in your state, you probably get challenged two games the entire season. Like you're probably overwhelming everyone else. Yeah, All right, we're gonna take a quick break there. Come back, talk about uh, the transfers coming in. Who Justin thinks out of the transfers? I have a list of them that are here, and the early enrollees for the freshmen could fight their way into the two deep this year. We're also going to talk a little bit about Cody Haddad and uh, some sad news on that front potentially. Yeah. But first, Ooh. Thing, Ooh. <laughs> but first, a quick break for friends of the show over at Nissan Motors, and man alive. I wish I could do Badger reads in conjunction with Nissan with this March Madness bracket highlight, but I cannot. So today's uh, bracket read for Nissan Motors is Arizona Wildcats, which can only be described as the Armada. The two seed is as hardcore as it gets, so it's no wonder they took it to LB State in the first round of the NCAA tournament. They're pay, uh, a favorite pick by many to make a run there and get into the Elite Eight with that basketball pedigree that program has. They get up and down the court. They are just like the Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada. Go find your next big adventure. Put the family in. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. That's NissanUSA.com. Go find your next big adventure. Today's episode is also brought to you by our good friends over at FanDuel. Um, and it's cool if your back bracket's busted. I mean, mine is too. But at least at FanDuel, you can continue betting on the action. I've just made a habit of betting the first half uh, spread on every UConn game. and It I, seems to be working. It, dude, what was the <laughs> the first spread in the UConn Northwestern game was eight. Oh wow! Oh, they blew that out of the water. Yeah, they were up forty to eighteen at halftime. That team is a monster. So go to fanduelcom slash locked on um, right now. New customers get two hundred in bonus bets if the first five dollar bet wins. That's fanduelcom slash locked on. Bet on college hoops until they cut the nets down. fanduelcom slash locked on. Here's a hint: just put money on UConn. Um, I, that team is a wagon, dude. I know we were chatting a little bit about it, but. It's, it, I'll tell you this really quick. I, I know we're, we weren't going to talk more basketball, Justin, but how depressing is it? And maybe it's not for you because you're already there, I think. But to see JMU beat us, I, I would say – And then get little, annihilated by Duke? And then just get murdered by Duke, right? Like, mm. I I kind of – when I started watching that game, the, the thing that stood out to me is Duke would have done the same thing to us. Probably. Like they, they were more athletic than us. I watched that part of that game, and I'm like – yeah, they would be athletically have the advantage at every at every position outside of of uh, store, and and store is not a plus defender, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, no, I I agree. Uh, well, well, Hannah says no one says stop Steph Curry, so don't put people's don't put words in people's mouths. Okay, I'm sorry, I. I I'm not trying to put words in anybody. We're not talking about you specifically, Will, but there are people out there that that have Connor listed as like a all conference type guard that's somehow put on the bench. He has shortcomings. Like he has some really good things that he can do, which mainly is when he gets hot and gets on a heater, he's a guy that's a problem to to hold down. But he also has had a few times this year where he just starts jacking up shots that are outside the offense that are just like, okay, we get it. You wanted to come in and pull one up, but it's not the time or situation for it. And I realize you're just trying to kind of prove that you deserve to be on the floor a little bit. And defensively, he's been a problem. Like he, he's, he has not been good defensively. And I realize most of the team has been bad defensively, yeah, sure. but it, it doesn't really help if he's not consistent from the outside shooting. Like if he was shooting 40%, he probably would have been playing. Yeah, he definitely would have been. Uh, Steve Mitchell said, He's on a team of shortcomings. That is a hundred percent true. Like that is not certainly not all on Connor. Yeah. Michael Wagner says, "Is Connor a power five guy?" Yes. I, I Connor's not as bad as he showed this year. Like, no, I, not at all. I'm not. I'm not trying to like crush the kid. I'm just saying that there's been this mythos around Connor that has developed where if he just played, he would he would be this all conference guy. I think he's there's got to be some development on his end too. I think, and I think the coaches play part too. Like everything we talked about, there's blame on both sides of this. I think ideally what he is going to be going forward is he's going to be a guy probably on a power five team getting 15 minutes a game coming in and providing some instant offense. Yeah. 
I agree. All right, let's let's talk more football again. I got derailed so easily. That's my fault. Um, let's let's talk transfers, Justin. I want I want to give you a couple names here. Who are you most who who are you most in on being um, in the two deep this year? And we're not going to talk Jaheim <laughs> Thomas, Tack, because I think those guys are going to be starters. But I'm going to give you a couple other names here. You tell me who you're most in on making. I, I won't even say two deep. Big contributions this year. You ready? Yep. Tyrell Henry, uh, Jackson McGonough, or Elijah Hills. Which of those three? Rank those three for you. Tyrell Henry, Henry Jackson. Um, Jackson, Jackson would be number one for me. I would probably have Elijah number two and then Tyrell three. I just think the wide receiver room is going to be improved this year. And Tyrell may be really good, but I think there is – like we've already heard Longo flat out say that he thought that uh, Williams made a massive jump this offseason. He said it's starting to click and he's starting to really show it. I think Green's going to be good. I think you have Tretch and Pauling that absolutely are going to light up the – slot and i think you have um anthony who i think is another guy on the outside that can do some things and then you have burrows too who sounds like he really took off so that's like six guys already so henry's got to be really good to come in and be and i'm not saying that these guys are going to be all conference type guys but he's going to have to be prove as a guy who's new to it that he understands everything and that he can be effective and make plays yeah that's a really good point on on what longo said longo had some interesting stuff to say he was on the camp um if you haven't heard it but he said Williams put on what 15, 15-ish pounds. And like so. yeah. he was already a pretty physical receiver. How about how about this? Could this receiver we talked so much last year about the receivers, right? When Green came in and CJ came in and Pauling. Could this be that that receiver group that we were talking about last year with a little more help, a little more growth? And with I, I think so. I think a lot of last year there were just so many problems. And I think that the receivers weren't as good as what we would have liked to. I don't I don't I think it a lot of them didn't fully understand what was being asked of them in the offense. And it probably made them a little indecisive and probably didn't help with separation. I think it, we saw in the bowl game, what happens when that seems to be kind of linked locked in. Mm -hmm. And I think that with all the other things that they start to click, I think, yeah, I think the wide receivers can be pretty good. I mean, we put up what 385 yards or whatever it was against LSU. And I realized LSU's defense wasn't great, but still it's not like, it's not like we found an extra 150 or 200 yards of passing offense no, in that true. game. I I, I want to point out, too, I always think it's funny when people kind of crap on that performance because LSU's defense is really bad. The Badgers played a lot of bad defenses mm-hmm. last year that they were unable to pass the mm-hmm. ball. Like, really, we really think Indiana's defense was like a world beater? Like, there. listen, um, LSU does have athletes, but there were a lot of defenses last year Wisconsin should have been able to move the ball better against, mm-hmm. and they just couldn't. So I'm, I'm not going to just completely throw away the LSU performance. Um how about your next three? Ready? Um, Tywee Walker, rank these. Tywee Walker, uh, John Pius, Leon Lowry. Oh, man, that's tough. Um, here I'll take this one to start. I think it's I think it's Lowry, Walker, and then Pius because I think Lowry's going to start, and I think Walker's your number two running back. I think they're all really in similar spot. Yeah. Um, it sounds like Pius is showing to be a dude too right away. Like Lowry and Lowry and Pius. All signs point after the first practice, based off of the the press people that were there, that those guys look like they are an upgrade over what we had. Like there's a talent infusion there. Um, so I think I, I'm in a weird spot because we've talked about this before. I don't know if Peterson's a lock to be a starter this year. It would not shock me if those two guys are in the two deep for sure, and then you have Walker as the number two running back. They're kind of all. It's like they're all equal. So it's like having like three ones kind of in this conversation. And that's why it was hard for me to answer because I think they're all going to play and I don't think, think they're I think they're all going to play a lot. Well, I think the linebackers to your point are going to rotate. Yeah. Like so that's a fair point. Like if you think of a, a bullpen in baseball and baseball's coming up so I mean it's a good time to talk about it. Like you have a guy who's going to come in and face a right-hander and a guy who's going to face a left-hander. You could have timeshares with Lowry and Pius mm-hmm. um or situationally and Peterson where situationally just one guy works a little better than the other. So I think that's probably a fair fair answer there. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, come back. Uh, I want to thank Justin on the early enrollees, who he thinks from these early enrollees that are in spring practice right now might fight their way into the 2D, plus get some of your questions. Um, God's coming up next on Locked On Badger, special kind of live random show here with Justin. Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends over at LinkedIn. Um, make all your hires better, more important, more efficient, and quite frankly, more successful with LinkedIn and their incredible professional network. That's linkedin.com slash college. Post your job for free. They are the number one professional um, hiring platform in the world for a reason small businesses have a ranked linkedin number one 
uh, three straight years because they get the job done and they do what they they do what hiring managers need them to do, which is find the right people, get them in the door, and everyone who does no business gets strained out by the the, the spaghetti strainer that just I still can't remember. Colander. The name. Colander. Use LinkedIn to colander your job applicants. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free. I'll remember that someday, dude. Um, all right. Let me kick it to you because I've, I've kind of just rolled through some of my talking points here. Uh, what's a spring football thing that, that really interests you that we haven't hit on? Um, Honestly, the wide receivers are going to be, be a big one for me. I, I want to hear the offense. I want to have hear some days where it's like the offense looks dominant. And, the, and by that, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be all the time, but I want I want the passing game to be a problem because I actually do think the back end of the defense is going to be pretty good this year. And if if we're carving them up, that tells me that I think the passing game is going to be pretty solid this year. Hmm. What about – I keep saying I'm, I'm not going to beat the dead horse. So the receivers, I agree. I'm, I'm super interested in the receivers and the offense in general. Defense line, I've said consistently I'm interested yeah. in. Um I'll, I'll give you another one. I'm, I'm kind of interested in the secondary and some of the young corners. If we're talking about one mm-hmm. that's a little kind of that we haven't talked about. It, it would be more of a question for me if they were, if we had more early in release. But I'm talking like the Amari Snowdens. I'm talking. Yeah, um, that's very true. And corners, they use Braden Moore as kind of the nickel corner against LSU. Is that like yeah. something he's going to be doing? I mean, you and I have talked offline about Snowden where I said flat out, I think if he doesn't prove that he can hit the two deep this year at corner, I think you need to move him to safety so that you're not hampering what he could be. Like you could get potentially three years out of him as a stud safety. Mm-hmm. Why waste it with him being at a cornerback position if he, if he's not challenging already? Because that position is going to get really tough really quick. And if he does, if you don't see the things, the tools physically for him to be able to start there, you need to move on from him there and and put him in a spot where he can be effective. He put on some good weight too. Like he's he got a little bigger, stronger. Um, that the safety position is interesting too, right? You got Braden Moore, uh, who played quite a bit last year at LSU. He was kind of the nickel guy. Preston Zachman's back, obviously. That was Austin Brown, Brown, wasn't it? Oh, Austin Brown. I said Braden Moore. Austin Brown, yeah. correct. And then Braden Moore is the younger guy the year um, after him. I'm interested to see what that rotation looks like too. Um, so I think the secondary in general kind of interests me. Uh, I want to see how the new the, the younger players develop. Jace Arnold's in that mix. JT Taylor's in that mix. A couple guys that, um, quite frankly, have athletic tools too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dennis Reynolds read Austin Brown at nickel. Wonder what what about transfer Delancey. Delancey actually was playing some on the outside. It sounds like I think that he may be a guy that they're going to move around and figure out what the best spot is for him. I, he's going to play. Like it sounds like he's he's got talent, and he actually showed a lot of talent last year with uh, who was it? Toledo. He came uh, from. I think it was Toledo. The Delancey. Yeah. He was BC right or am I? No, Matry was BC. Delancey yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. I think it's Toledo. Um, so yeah, he's it sounds like they they like his skill set. So I think they feel like there's some versatility there with him. And I don't think it hurts anything to have somebody testing on the outside. Like Forkarine was solid, I thought, last year, but I think that he, he was not amazing. Like you you can definitely try somebody else on the outside and check and see if who you think might be the best option at that position. So I don't have any issue with them putting Glancy there or not. They, and I'm guessing they probably have some options that they're looking at in the interior. We talked about a few guys who might be able to start to, to show some things at that spot. Um, who was the corner that came in a couple of years back? That was a Chris one. Uh, Max Lofi. Um, no, 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 no. More Jace recent Arnold. than that. J- Jace Arnold. Arnold. Jace Arnold. Uh, Jace Arnold. So Arnold. He's, a, he's a guy that potentially could start to flash there. Um, I Obviously, the, the two young guys that we really want to see out there – are not in house yet in uh Agard and, Lucas. Agard and uh yeah and and uh Lucas let me ask you Harper this. Harper we want to see you there too I know he jumps in here a lot too we want to see you there too boy Harper's <laughs> a solid man I love Harper's yeah. film um good attitude yes I'll say that because I think Porkrin's a guy too that gets slept on I think he's a bigger physical cornerback he put on yeah I think there was a learning experience for him last year it's it, a ju- it was a super jump in talent well, don't forget Mac from Air Force as well. I yeah. know we're kind of getting scatterbrain, but there's a. I guess the beer. I'm is- curious on him. We saw that the weights come out. If he's going to get some slotted at some safety time, he came uh-huh. in at like 205 or something like that, which is really big for a corner. Yeah, I wonder though if that's because he's like a six foot, six foot one corner, right? Yeah. Like maybe that's that's probably not that big for a six foot, six foot one. I, corner. Guess, it, I guess it depends how heavy footed he is. If he's got quick feet, it doesn't matter. 
I think this feeds into the discussion that there's a lot of bodies at cornerback, and that that's mm-hmm. something that we definitely were tracking because in the fall, Agard and Lucas, to your point, come in, and with that glut of bodies, Justin, and considering they didn't get here early, are those guys going to get into the two deep? Because originally we had thought they would. Um, I I'd also thought Agard was going to originally be here early. Yeah, I uh, thought so too. I don't know if they get into too deep without getting I, here. I don't know if they do initially. I could see it happening during the course of the season. I just think the talent's there for it. But, yeah, coming in in the fall is going to be a little problem from that standpoint. Um, it's definitely they need the reps. You don't want to be throwing somebody who came into fall camp unless they're just a freak show into the into the two deep because they're probably not going to be ready from an instinct standpoint. There's a lot of valuable reps you get in the – not only – not only here in the spring, but in like summer conditioning and everything. And he'll get some of that because they'll be able to come in for it. But it's, it's, you're kind of behind the curve at that point. Like you're, you're kind of working on what you learned in the spring and the summer stuff when you do that. And now you're just kind of learning everything fresh that they want you to work on from a technique standpoint. Yeah. Are you, where are you at just from a overall hype slash confidence level? Spring's still starting. We had a bunch of updates we're going to get. Last year we were through the, I mean, through the moon. Um, everybody was not just us. Where are you at right now? I, I don't know, honestly. I, I look at this this year, and I, I have high hopes, but nothing. I'm I'm. It's kind of like how I am with basketball right now. Like, I want to believe things will be better, but I I don't know without actually seeing it. So I I have high hopes that what the the moves that were made are going to be productive moves, and it's going to improve us. But I need until we start hearing some things come out, it's hard for me to get too far ahead of it. I think that there's there's a chance they could be a lot better this year. And whether what that means in terms of record, I don't know. But I, I, I think they could be a lot more competitive and a lot more athletic than we were last year. I think the defense is going to be a lot more athletic. Mm-hmm. And I see – I want to throw this comment or this thought out here because I see a lot of people saying I got excited last year, so I'm not going to this year. Last year has nothing to do with this year. Yeah. Um, there's been so, so much difference to change, too. It, well, it just it, – it just has no real bearing on what we are this year. It just, it's a different quarterback. It's a, a different staff in some areas. Just because you underperformed last year doesn't mean you're going to this year. So I, I actually think there's a chance this team, we the pendulum has swung too far, and now this team is a little undervalued mm-hmm. in some ways. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's going to come down to a lot of things. And there's people like uh, Nick Oson, our boy, he was talking about them a little bit and saying that he's, he's really hyped about them. Um, I, he, I think he thinks we're going to upset a few people. And if we do that, that's great. Like, if we can find a way, honestly, what it, what that does, if you find a way to, say, take out USC and take down a Penn State, that gives you an opportunity that if you cough up a game against somebody who's not a team you should lose to, it's not as big of a deal. Like, yeah. from a record standpoint, it's not going to sting you. You could go 9-3 and three because you took out a couple of teams that nobody expected you to, and now you're moving forward. This this team this there is a lot of upside here, like whether that's realized or not is is really difficult to say. But there's a chance TVD t- returns to freshman form. If he yeah. does that, if he turns into that guy, then all bets are off of what this team is. Like you put a quarterback out there that can be a dominant quarterback, and you have say the running backs are at least solid. The offense could be a problem because I do think that I think tight ends gonna be a lot better this year. Like you have every Ashcraft's going to be a lot more developed. You're going to have McGowan that's out there. That's going to be a guy who I think can, can really press up the seam and cause some issues. He's just that type of athlete. And I think there's a couple other guys that you can look at. You, you have the freshmen that are coming in that maybe, maybe they can figure out a couple packages to get them involved. I don't know if they'll necessarily happen for sure, but there might be some opportunity there for them to, to make some plays. I do expect a big bump in production from that position this year. And it, may people, double, it may not, and it may not be huge overall, but it may be double what it was last year. Yeah, I can see that, and and people are really all over the map, right? Because uh, Brett Roll, I think it'll be a fight to just get to a bowl game, and that's that's a fair perspective too. I think we're going to be better. The schedule a little tougher. Uh, I think some of the teams like USC. I'm not that worried. I'm not going to say I'm not that worried about USC. USC can absolutely beat us. We lost to Indiana yeah. or Western last year, um, but they lost to a lot of bad teams too, though. So I mean, it's it's a, it's a coin flip game. I'm just gonna say, like USC lost six games last year, and people are acting like they're they're the the yeah they're coming in to run the Big Ten. <laughs> like, get out of here with that. They could totally, totally not be very good next year, and it really shouldn't shock people. They may struggle. Utah had their number, 
And there's yeah. a lot of Utah type teams in the Big Ten. I'm not saying necessarily that they're playing to the level that Utah was, but physical defense and teams that want to come downhill and just get punt push you around. There's a lot of that in the Big Ten. Yeah. Iowa's going to be that way. Penn State's going to be that way. Michigan, Ohio State, everybody's going to get physical with them, and they're going to have to prove that they that they're not just a finesse team. Uh, Brandon Noble says, if Ryan doesn't jump on the fire guard train, he's too stubborn. Listen, one of the things we do with this show, man. I'll keep is, working on him. Yeah, everybody can fan how they want to fan, though. Like, mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, everybody just wants the Badgers to be good. Um, I think, I don't know, I, I'm still reflecting on guard. But I I don't know. I'm still reflecting on guard. I will say this. I, I think people don't fully think about the idea that you could you, there's way there are worse coaches in great guard and you can make a bad hire and go into a tailspin i don't uh, i don't think you can do that you can't be scared though yeah like you have to tr you have to go attack it like why Why would you attack it being with the mindset that i'm the likelihood here that i'm going to fail because a lot of programs do historically a lot I of do. programs make bad hires but i think and you and i have seen that historically a lot of programs take risks on guys who leverage one year of success into being an opportunity to jump because they become a storyline or whatever and they're flashy and you and i both know that's not how you do it with basketball coaches like you want the guy who's been toiling and consistently putting up winning seasons and is good like i would i would 100 take a, a sun belt or one of these teams that the coach consistently gets his team in the automatic bid from whatever league they're in because you know he's winning his conference all the time and he probably just deserves the opportunity. It's like it's like Leipold at Buffalo, and probably should have been. I, it's it astounds me, quite frankly, that nobody gave him an opportunity at the Division One level earlier when he was absolutely oh. running it in uh, Division Three. He's like a what a hundred and nine and six or something like that. Yeah, that it is wild. And I'll say this: I think Gregor should be on the hot seat. Like I think I think he should be on the hot seat. I, I you can't listen. There's no there's nothing acceptable about status quo of losing in the first round and losing to James Madison. That's not, we said it on the show, Justin, James is not that good. And they yeah. proved it by being murdered by Duke. Like Wisconsin should have won that game. And ultimately yeah. there comes a point where excuses don't matter anymore. You have to win in March. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just want to read this one from Zach Bartz here. There's really not a, any solid candidates out there this cycle, unless there's one flying under the radar, but frankly, guard is on borrowed time. I disagree with this, and I think you do too. If you if you start really researching into this, there's a lot of really good coaches out there that just don't have the publicity that they deserve. Like if we dig into it, and I'm not even saying this. Listen, Bo Ryan was destroying it down at Platteville. Like mm -hmm. these guys do exist down there that are really, really good coaches at their level. They're not given opportunity, and you don't find out whether they're good. A lot of these guys that are killing it wherever they're at, I would rather take a risk on a guy who I know has proven that he can take whatever he's got and make and be successful with it, especially at that level where it's like your resources are limited and find out whether he's capable of taking the additional resources and, and turning into something special because we see too many guys that have the resources and just flub them away and don't remotely take advantage of them. There's great coaches everywhere. Like I coached mm -hmm. at the division three level. I coached with a guy who went to the division one level who's like, there's great coaches everywhere, but again, it's the trick. You got to find it. And mm -hmm. it's, if it was it's so hard work digging through to find the guys. And if it was so easy, every program would make great hires all the time. Like mm -hmm. it's not, it's not simple. And as long as fans, listen, I'll say this. And as long as fans know that you could hire a guy and it could get worse, I'm fine with it. Like mm -hmm. just don't, well, I always take that mindset. Don't pretend like every coach you bring in is going to win. I, I just don't think that, that being apathetic and just, being like, all right, well, this is who we are now is the way to do it to me. Like, I don't, I don't want that. I'd rather swing big and take a chance that we we hit a home run than just toil and sit there and and hope for a walk. Mm -hmm. Someone mentioned uh, there's been a bunch of names in the chat. Um, we might do a show. I know Justin, you and Rajiv are going to be doing a show later today, anyway. So maybe you'll get more into that. Uh, the one name that came up that gets talked about a lot: Ryan Hepting, uh, Lamont Paris, obviously connections. <laughs> It sounds like his connection to guard is a lot of people don't think that that would be likely. Like he would he's loyal too loyal. Yeah. Like he, if, if they let guard go, he would be like, yeah, I'm not doing that. That's, that's my, my friend. I'm not jumping in right after him. And I do think Paris is a, is a winning coach, but then again, you look at it, 
they flamed out right away in the first round too this year. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he doesn't, have, he doesn't have the track record though of doing it over multiple years. That no, guard. he do, he does not. And, and, and quite frankly, I don't think South Carolina has been anything special for basketball recently. So it was a step up for him. But we'll we'll see. I mean, that I don't know what he is as a recruiter. I'm guessing that that team was a heck of a lot more athletic than anything we've had recently. But I don't know what to make of it. He may, he got them to win, which is a start. If he starts consistently doing this, then he's going to prove that he's a dude. I, I do want to throw this out there too, Justin, quick. And then uh, we'll probably sign off because I've already kept you longer. But I believe guard has a pretty hefty buyout if you were to let him go. Uh, I haven't actually confirmed that. I think it's what yeah. the runner read is twelve million, and that's I. If, if they own twelve million, he's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I hate to be the bearer of bad that's, news. That's kind of nuts if they do. Yeah. Like, I, who was who were you thinking was coming to get him? Like, this was his dream job. Like, if somebody was going to come in, they weren't they weren't paying twelve million for guard. Like, I don't care what he did here. It's not like he had postseason success over the last five six years. So whoever threw that in there. It's like, what what were you thinking with this? Like you just really, and maybe that maybe that was guards protection. Maybe he put that in there because he's like, well, you're gonna fire me. Here, here's my buyout. I doubt that was the. I doubt that was the. No, I don't mean like they, they thought he was gonna get fired, but it's like protection for him. Like, I've had some rough seasons and ups and downs here. Like I'm, you know, it never hurts to have a little extra protection there. Well. There, there is an element too. If you have a coach in a program, you have to commit to them, or they become lame ducks, and they, it's really hard to recruit. Like, so if if guard is the guy, you had to give him the ability to say, "I'm going to be the guy for a long time here." Well, Hannah, you better damn well get a coach that can recruit if you toss guard. So part of this is whoever is going to recruit better, at least the state of Wisconsin, because guard has flat out decided that he's not going to deal with AAU coaches, which is part of why Wisconsin struggles so much in the state of Wisconsin. The coaches don't like that. If you're going to go recruit the family, you're going to have somebody buzzing in that recruit's ear now the entire time, probably anti you, which is going to be an issue the entire time. But if that's the way you're going to handle it, that's that it is what it is at that point. Yeah, Wisconsin in state recruiting has been invisible. I, I've never had a huge issue with it as long as you can get equally good players somewhere else. It's like the football argument. Uh, but slightly a little different. But you know, if you can get talent, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if you're not getting the talent, and then you, and then you're also seeing in-state kids go out somewhere else and flourish, that's where the problem lies. Like if he was getting four-star forwards that are super athletic out of the Dakotas and in tennis, like nobody would care, right? Mm-hmm. But the fact that we're not doing that, and we're also seeing Wisconsin talent go somewhere else and flourish. All right, Justin, I'm gonna let you go. I know you have another show as well. Um, I do appreciate it, everybody in chat. Thank you guys so so much. Really do appreciate that as always. Uh, go check out Justin Rajiv later tonight or watch him the, the next day. I mean, certainly everyone knows your guys' channel at the Bucket mm-hmm. Report. Um, thankfully, football's coming, Justin. Yeah, no kidding. We got two weeks, people, until the next practice with spring break going on. And then we can really hit the ground running. Oh, somebody had put in there earlier asking if there's going to be a spring game. My understanding of it is the field is still being worked on at Camp Randall, and and that's why we're not having a spring game this year. Yep. Um, they may have something that goes on, but it's not going to be like the launch last year. Sounds like the athletic department has mentioned that sometime in the fall practice camp, they're going to have some type of open event for the fans. So that okay. will be where we go. As far as for the Bucky report tonight, it will be 1030 central time. We're going to be going live. Well, Hannah said, Justin, you, me and Ryan are more athletic than the, that. not, not us at 40. Will maybe you <laughs> <laughs> No man. I might have played better post defense than some guys. <laughs> Wall them up, man. Um, yeah. oh, Greg and Ryan, where did you go to boot camp? I went to uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. Um, anyway, all right, guys, on Wisconsin. We will talk later. Justin, thank you so much. Um, football's coming.